right. Can everybody hear me okay? We got you. All right. Well, welcome everybody to another uh, React 19 webinar. This one's going to be really good. This is going to be like a panelist um, format. So we have four panelists. We're going to have, you know, the the illustrious Brianne Dressen with us. We have uh, Justin Prince and Kyle Warner and then myself also on the panel. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start out by just taking like three to five minutes, introducing yourself, panelists, and kind of um, what, um, I guess, what brought you here? <laughs> and then, um, and then, and then we're going to ask some questions to kind of get some dialogue going of, of all the, the different treatments and things that we've tried. So um, I'll go ahead and start real quick. Again, my name is Lauren Jepson. Um, I, let's see, I'm, I'm retired military now. Um, I, at the time, was mandated to get the vaccine back. I got it back in October of 21 now. Um, and then uh, a week later, landed in the hospital with all the, you know, all the neurological symptoms and everything. And then long story short, went through a medical evaluation board um, and um, was retired from medically retired from the military. And, um, and throughout the entire process, all those years, basically figured out a lot of um, good things, um, treatments and things like that, that have worked for me. So that's me. Uh, Bree, you wanna go next? Yeah, and, and thanks Lauren, and thanks for your service too, in mm -hmm. multiple ways to our country. And then also, you know, being vaccine injured too. So anyway, so yeah, I'm Brianne. Um, I'm the co-chair of React 19. Um, I co-founded this organization basically because there were too many of us. And so we couldn't, you know, just keep going without any kind of organized effort. So thanks for everybody for pitching in and doing what needs to be done to help each other and, as well as to help ourselves. So anyways, I'm an injured clinical trial participant neurological complications. I do a whole bunch of different super expensive medications. Um, yeah, that's me. We'll go with uh, Justin next. Sure. Uh, my name is Justin Prince. I, um, before the injury, I used to work in the meat market. I was a recording musician. Um, it was June 22nd, 2021. I had got the second Moderna shot, had immediate reaction and, uh, you know, put me in the emergency room several times. And, you know, as time has went on, um, it's been a lot of trial and error and us being our own, um, you know, doctors, unfortunately. And um, so I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying a lot of different things of uh, supplements, peptides, um, different alternative therapies and stuff like that to try to manage some of like the, you know, neurological, um, muscular, um, those types of symptoms. And, uh, you know, I found some things that help and some things that have made it worse. Um, so it's a lot of trial and error, but, uh, yeah, that's me. All right. Thank you. And then Kyle Warner. Yeah, um, my name's Kyle, and I'm a professional mountain bike racer. So that was my career um, since I was about 21 years old. And yeah, I got the Pfizer vaccine in June of 2021. That was my second dose, and I had a really bad reaction and developed um, pericarditis, myocarditis, mast cell activation syndrome, and POTS. So those kind of my diagnosis is. And um, yeah, in the last couple of years, it's just been this journey of trying to get better, connecting with Bree and the whole team at React 19 and everyone else on the internet, just trying to figure out some solutions and try to heal. Um, I've been, I feel very fortunate with how far I've been able to come. Um, I had a lot of great access to medical care, uh, doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and also a few other things that we'll kind of talk about, I'm sure, in this podcast or this uh, seminar. So I feel pretty good right now, which I'm excited about. And I'm actually going to be moving to DC in the next month or so to lobby on behalf of React 19. So that'll be, it's kind of a breaking news a little bit, but <laughs> so that'll be fun. All right. Well, thank you and welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. So um, the way I want to start this out, I, I want to say, let's go with, do we want the negative or the positive first? We want, you know, the dessert or the veggies. Um, <laughs> those can be negative or positive, depending on how you look at it. Um, 
Okay, so someone someone said negative. So <laughs> let's go with, let's ask the question, what are the, I guess, the top three things that have not worked for you? And maybe expound on how, like what that thing did to you um, or if, you know, how it increased your flare up. So let's, let's go reverse order. Let's start with Kyle again. If you could, if you could talk about what three things um, did not help you or potentially made it worse. I might need to think about that for a second, actually. I, I feel like the thing that I felt early on as I was seeing a naturopath trying to get help with uh, supplementation. And so that was kind of one of the things where, you know, in the fitness industry or kind of like sporting thing, they say, you know, the difference between a supplement and a steroid and they're like steroids actually work. So that was like always something that I kind of had in the back of my head is like, okay, so supplements are there to supplement, you know, small incremental gains. It's not like this drug um, where it's going to really make a huge change. And so I think one thing that I kind of went down the rabbit hole of a bit was I had so many pills and supplements and everything I was taking. And I started to kind of overdose on um, especially quercetin and a few other things where they were basically just loading me up, trying to get my uh, allergic reaction and my mast cell stuff to calm down. And so I definitely noticed um, I got to the point where that stuff was becoming a detriment. And I ended up having to kind of pull things back, find a baseline of like, all right, let's, you know, pull all the supplements back, find a baseline. How do I feel without anything? And then like one by one, add them back in. Cause I think when I was taking, you know, 20, 30 things, then it was just too much at once. And I couldn't really figure out what was doing what. Um, so yeah, that's one thing I can say for sure. And then, you know, it was interesting cause early on there was like Dr. Bruce Patterson. And so he was doing a lot of work with uh, long COVID patients. And one of the things that they were seeing was like a cytokine and interleukin storm. So it's basically like a pro-inflammatory protein. And they were giving a drug called Maraviroc for people, which is essentially like an AIDS medication they're repurposing to try to help with the immune modulation. And I didn't really want to go down that route because I'd heard some mixed reviews of people that were on that. And then they got off and they had a little bit of issue or they would kind of relapse. And so then I started doing research on um, what other therapies can help with cytokine or interleukin storm. So like reducing pro-inflammatory proteins. And that is where I actually found the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And so that was one thing where um, I didn't go down the Maraviroc Marava route, but I kind of talked with them, figured out the method of action, what, what they were trying to accomplish, and then tried to find another therapy that worked with maybe a little bit less side effect profile. Um, although the hyperbaric, hard shell hyperbaric with the nurse and the 100% oxygen is very expensive. And so that was one thing where it's like, $200 a session. I did 70 sessions. So that's 14,000 out of pocket. So it's, you know, it's a lot of money. And I understand a lot of people are not able to kind of take that leap. Um, and also I tried to petition my insurance to get it covered. And since I didn't have an active wound, you know, it's used for burns and wounds. And so that was something that they were not going to cover. And so, yeah, I just said, screw it. I'm going to, you know, jump in. I'm going to try this thing. I did about 15 sessions. I started to feel um, a lot of benefit. And then there was the times where like I would go five days a week and I'd feel like crap by Friday because my body would just be so beat down. And then usually by Sunday, I had like a really good day. And then I would do the five sessions again. And then my next Sunday was really good again. And so it's kind of like working out where, you know, you go to the gym, you're sore, your body feels like crap. And then eventually when it recovers and you feel better than you used to. And that was that thing I had to ride for a bit. But I could tell I was trending in the right direction after about 15 sessions. And then I just doubled down, did 40 sessions kind of went out into the world, tried to live my normal life for about a month and a half um, on the road traveling and, and trying to do some mountain bike stuff again. I had a really bad relapse, ended up coming back and did 30 more sessions. And then ever since that, I kind of like, I got up to a plateau where I haven't really had a big relapse since then. Um, so, and then I know you asked for three things. And uh, the other thing that I did that didn't really help that I got, I guess, kind of pulled into was a uh, vestibular therapy. And so it was for me personally, they were trying to help me get over my POTS symptoms which is um, an autonomic nervous system disorder, where basically your kind of lizard brain, so your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system are not working in conjunction. And so they were trying to do a vestibular therapy, which is essentially vision and balance processing. Um, it's a lot of what they do for post-concussive treatment. And so I did probably 10 or 15 sessions of vestibular therapy, and I wasn't noticing an improvement on that. And that was also quite expensive. And so I, I pulled back on that pretty quickly. Um, maybe if I would have given it more time, it would have helped, but I think the hyperbaric and the neurofeedback is what I ended up feeling the best, uh, changes from in regards to my pot symptoms too. So. That's awesome. So you'd say the hyperbaric worked 
um, you said hyperbaric and neural feedback. Yeah. And the thing that is really confusing for a lot of people as well is I did try doing soft shell hyperbaric for a bit, which is that, you know, like a clinic and those ones are usually quite a bit cheaper, um, but it's not hundred percent oxygen. It's usually using an oxygen concentrator and it's about 37% oxygen instead of 99. And also it's at a lower pressure. And I probably did about 10 or 15 sessions of that and felt no change. And I was really bummed because, you know, I'd heard, oh, this might work. This might be something that I could try. And then I talked to a doctor and they're like, no, there's a significant difference between, you know, the nurse with the high oxygen content and a higher pressure and having someone on staff that's like giving you air breaks and all these different things. Um, and so they were like, just try that first before you give up on it. And so that's one thing where the hyperbaric mild, you know, a soft shell did not work for me. And then when I kind of reassessed and I was really kind of distraught, I was like, I don't know what to do now. I feel like I've tried everything. And then when I did the hard shell, that did work for me. But I also had um, some sinus issues that just from a deviated septum from playing football. And so that was something that we had to talk to the nurses about. And like they had to pressurize me really slowly so that I could get my ears to adjust. And that was things I had to work around. Um, but yeah, just little things like that. Okay. That's, that's awesome. So can you, um, explain more of what symptoms you felt relief from, um, when you did a hyperbarics? Yeah. And actually, um, I'm going to drop something in the chat really quick too. I just did a podcast with a guy named Jason Saunders who he's undergoing the first PhD program for hyperbarics. And, um, he was really nice. He gave me about an hour of his time and we talked quite a bit about all of the different things that it does in the body. So, um, I'm going to drop that in the chat really quick for people that may be interested just for later. And I actually asked him a few questions that other people had had. So I just put that in the chat. Okay, um, as far as symptoms, <clears throat> the thing that I felt the most relief from with that was like the mass fatigue. And so that was where I was really struggling because I was at the point where I could kind of do, I don't know, an hour or two of emails and then I would just be set, you know, back into the bed for the rest of the day or I'd start to feel a little better and maybe go on like a walk around the neighborhood and then be back in bed. And I couldn't really get over that hump to where I could start being active and start to like build on that. Cause every time I would try, I would just set myself back. And so with the hyperbaric, it got me to the point where I, um, after about 15 sessions, we signed up for the local gym and I was like working out with, you know, all the older ladies in the classes, trying to get things done really slowly, really lightweight and just start building, building, building. And I was able to start getting some of those building blocks and recover. And so that was really helpful, but like I said, the, the therapy itself, like it's so oxygen intensive and your brain requires so much oxygen and like processes so much that I felt like absolute crap after the sessions. And that was something that I had to really trust the doctor and lean on them. And, and they're like, you're going to feel terrible after you get done with this. And it's like working out, you're going to feel tired and fatigued and then you'll kind of come back up. And so that's why I said, I do those five days, I'd pull back, I'd feel good on the weekends. And uh, my partner at the time, April, she would just kind of tell me like, oh my God, like you seem normal again. This is crazy. And so that was a, my first external validation from her to saying like, on the weekends, you seem normal and I'm really glad to have you back. And then that was when I was like, all right, let's keep doing this and see what happens. So yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah. I did, I did hyperbarics as well. And I found out, I found out, I guess the hard way about hyperbarics so I went, I usually am up in the mountains a lot. And so I went really high in elevation, had a lot of, or should I say, not a lot of oxygen. And, um, and then I had a massive event and that's when I started investigating, you know, oxygen and the nervous system and things like that. And that's when I stumbled into hyperbarics and I had a, a similar episode. I only did like 20 sessions, um, again, cause of the price I was lucky and, the, um, the people that I ran into, they, they were super cool and gave me like a 50% discount. Um, so I, I, I did 20 sessions and was feeling pretty good. Similar to you, like in, in the, um, chamber and again, like I very similar to you. So I had sinus issues and things like that because, uh, in the military, I used to fly jets and I had my sinuses like explode in my face one time. So that was awesome. And so I have all these like blockages and things. Um, but they had to take me down really slow and bring me out really slow. And then while I was in there, you kind of like mine really helped. It helped uh, just nervous system in general. Right. So I had 
all my autonomic stuff just going off like crazy, but, and I could feel it. Like I'd be twitching and all sorts of stuff. But then as I got out and as I did it longer, it, it was able to, those symptoms were subsiding over time. So, um, yeah, hyperbarics, I feel, you know, yeah, does a really good, good for well, you. The unfortunate thing is they're expensive. It's expensive. And the thing that you just mentioned that is like a kind of similar in my experiences, the elevation issues where I was living in Boise, Idaho at like 3000, just over 3000 foot elevation. And I was really having a hard time being active. Like I would just even go to the gym or trying to do like a little bike ride or anything. Once I started feeling better, I would feel like I would get drained so quickly. And then whenever we would come down to my hometown in California, that's at a hundred feet elevation, I would feel dramatically better. Like, you know, I could get an extra one or two days of activity per week. And so then I started kind of paying attention to that. And every time we'd go up into high elevation, I'd start to struggle more. Um, and even recently, about a month and a half ago, I slept up in Tahoe at 7,500 feet elevation. And I woke up in the middle of the night, like red and blue spots in my vision and my heart, it was like 110 resting and I felt terrible. And I started driving down the hill and my heart rate started to calm back down. So I think there's something, I don't know what it is, but whether it's mitochondrial dysfunction or just something where I'm not uptaking oxygen properly, I never had that issue in the past. Like I actually, you know, got third at national championships uh, two years in a row at Mammoth, which is at 11,000 feet elevation. So, you know, it's one of the best in the nation at mountain biking, 11,000 feet. And now I'm like having a hard time sleeping at 7,000. So there's something different, but for me, the oxygen seemed to be something that helped the most. Um, and I know we were going off on the negatives. There's a few other things that helped me as well, but I was trying to kind of <laughs> pack it up. Um, right, right. Yeah. So any other questions, just let me know too on that stuff. But then that podcast, Jason Saunders talks a lot about the benefits that come from pressurizing, but he said they're learning that about half or roughly half of the benefit actually comes from depressurizing. And when you get out of the chamber, that oxygen has to escape your body. And that's when it'll start to interact with some different tissues that it may not normally. So, yeah. Justin, so did you ever try HBOT? That's one I still have not tried. I feel like I kind of read into it and kind of freaked me out a little bit at first. I feel like there was something that was like, you know, in the extreme cases, it could like cause like a lung issue or like, like it flare up tinnitus and stuff. So I kind of went the ozone route beforehand, but I do feel like the H bot is, is, is next on my list for sure. Yeah. And it's interesting. Cause like Dr. Saunders talks a lot about how, you know, when you go up in elevation, it's not necessarily that the oxygen itself is different in content. It's like, there's a little bit less oxygen, but not drastically different. What's different is the pressure. And so when you're in a lower pressure environment, your body's not basically getting that uh, dissolved gas in your fluid or in your plasma as much. And so that's the thing. I haven't tried ozone. I know a lot of people that have sworn by ozone. Um, but theoretically, with ozone, you're oxygenating all the red blood cells. And you're not necessarily oxygenating, oxygenating the plasma, which is kind of the difference with hyperbaric. So um, I don't know if anyone does have more questions. Definitely uh, look at that podcast. I know Margie was talking about the carbon monoxide. And I actually did test mine, Margie, so I saw you put that in there. And I also asked Dr. Saunders about it, and he said he has not had anyone have that concern. Um, so, yeah, he said the only sorry, way. You. Sorry, um, Margie put the carbon monoxide might be a thing. And he said the only way that he could see carbon monoxide being an issue is if they used a bad compressor. And the compressor itself had some, like, oil leaking or something that would be putting some CMO into the um, chamber and theoretically that was the only thing he could think of but other than that yeah I did get one of those devices from Margie and I tested it so the the not so sunny side of HBOT just so we can go over it because we talked about the sunny side just like everything else there's the not so sunny side mm -hmm. um, I actually am one of those people that tried HBOT it didn't go well for me um, not to say that it won't go well for people um, let's see Margie she mentions in the chat and Margie, if you want to put your email out to everyone so they can get a little measure. So there, yeah. So the concern is, is that there is some uh, carbon monoxide saturation concerns with um, HBOT use. Um, and so that's something that she's in connection with a researcher that's looking into that correlation or that connection. Um, so she can help you get in connection with that researcher if you want to try to see if CO is a is a thing for you when you do HBOT. 
And let's see, there's someone else in here that said they did a ton of sessions and it didn't do anything for them. But then there's also a few people that said that they liked it. Um, a lot of people are saying, I can't afford one session. Ditto. My session was gifted to me, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. It's an interesting new technology. Um, it's going into clinical trials right now for long COVID, just so you guys know. Um, but it means that it will probably be FDA approved for long COVID treatments but long before back injury treatments. But anyway, so that's the latest on HBOT. I do have another interesting oxygen spin on that. And that's actually one of my things that have helped. So one of my things that helped was actually a spinoff of HBOT because I didn't tolerate it. And it's called uh, Live, Live O2. And basically what it is, it's, it's an oxygen machine and, they, and you have a mask just like you do with HBOT, right? They sit you on a bike or in a recliner or on a treadmill and they have you walk for like a minute and a half, super slow. And like, I mean, super slow. Like when they told me to do it, I was like, you guys are nuts. <laughs> so, and they, um, and then what they'll do is they'll hit you for 30 seconds with sea level oxygen. So full oxygen saturation. Then they'll run you back to, a, you know, at elevation, which here we're sitting at like 4,500 feet in elevation, you know, if people live here, then they'll usually make you a little bit more hypoxic. So they'll throw you up to like 7,000, 8,000 in the oxygen saturation that's going in your, in your mask. And then you'll run that for walk that, but they'll run, you know, a lower concentration of oxygen, oxygen into your mask for a minute and a half. And then they'll flip it over for 30 seconds at full oxygen saturation. And what happens is the theory behind this new oxygen delivery method is that when you're hypoxic, your microcapillaries throughout your body and in your brain, they expand a little bit to absorb more oxygen, right? And that's kind of the theory behind what goes on when people are climbing Mount Everest, right? So then what happens is your microcapillaries expand a little bit, and then you hit it with more oxygen. So then your body absorbs more oxygen for 30 seconds. Um, and then of course you can't do that for a long time. Right. And so then they clap it back down. So you are back down to baseline and then they hit you again with more oxygen. The first time I tried it, I did it for seven minutes is all, that's all I could tolerate. But I kid you not, when I got done, I had feeling back in my hand that had not been there in two years. And it was like, you know, like when your hand wakes up when, from when it's asleep and it hurts really bad, it was like that. And I was like, Oh, there's something to this. That being said, it's super expensive, just like HBOT. It was like 75 bucks per session, but I did it for, you know, as much as I could in the fall. And every time I saw improvement for two days after the therapy, I felt super good. Like my brain was clearer and I was able to do more things around the house. Um, anyway, so it worked well for me. I do know one other person that's tried it and they said it went well. And I do know the not so sunny side, I do know another person that did it and it didn't go so well for her. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a different spin on this and that's oxygen a, idea. One thing that I've kind of heard from quite a few people is that, you know, I personally didn't have any neuropathy issues like burning tingling. I guess you could say that the POTS, since it's like an autonomic nervous system disorder, that's a little bit of a neuropathic issue. However, I didn't have the neuropathy and burning, tingling, all that sensation. So a lot of the people that suffer with hyperbaric seem to be from that realm of injury is what I've seen. Like people that flare with hyperbaric seem to have more neurological issues. Um, but yeah, that's like Dr. Jason Saunders, the guy that I did the podcast with, he actually had drop foot. And so he had a nerve issue. He had drop foot. And that's how he discovered hyperbaric is that he used the hyperbaric to get his drop foot to function again. Now he has full mobility in his foot. And so that's what got him really excited about it. Um, but I know that you can definitely overdo it and it's not like a perfect treatment by any means and it's expensive and it's hard to find. And so, yeah, I, I understand it's not for everybody. It's not going to help everyone, but that is what I used to help get like quite a bit better. And yeah. I think that's the kind of to the, the preface, you know, to throw all this out, this might not help for everyone. And we're seeing a lot of different, um, symptoms and things like that through through everyone and so i would say 
which is, you know, if you've tried it, you know, and it didn't work for you, then it might be something else. There might be something that works for you and not for somebody else, but that's the whole reason of having this kind of panel and discussion is to, to get those ideas out there and then, and then talk about people's experiences, good and bad. And that hopefully can, can help us, um, in our own kind of pathway as, as we kind of figure out what's going on here. So yes, Kyle, thank you. I want to hear from Justin. Uh, I want you to name something that might not have worked for you, but then also something that, that you feel like works really well for you. Yeah, sure. Um, first thing I, I didn't want to cut anyone off, but, um, with the live oxygen thing, it kind of sounds like, I think Jenny had mentioned it in the comments too. Um, it kind of sounds like, uh, EWAT or the ex exercise with oxygen therapy kind of curious if that's the same thing or if there's slight differences there um, but I know some other people that have tried that um, for me the key couple things that were really like a night and day like my body totally didn't agree with it um, unfortunately uh, hydroxychloroquine was one of them um, it flared up my tinnitus really bad every single time. Like I tried it five times and I, you know, over the span of like nine months or something. And every time it would just really start flaring up the tinnitus stuff. Um, so I can't take that. And um, the other one was, um, I think it kind of came around like a year ago or so there was, uh, I'm not going to say the, the brand name, but there was like this frequency device and some people were saying it helped them a lot and some people it made them a lot worse. And um, so I kind of was just trying different things and uh, this like frequency device totally like ramped up all my stuff that, you know, early on, a lot of my symptoms were kind of uh, come and go, I you know, um, and when I tried like this frequency device, it just ramped everything up. The, like the tachycardia stuff was on full, you know, uh, full effect and the uh like the spasms and and tremor stuff kind of flared up too and it flared up my neuropathy so um you know for me personally there was this one device that was like the frequency device that my body didn't really agree with and it was it was a pretty bad setback for a long time it took me a while to kind of bounce back from that um but those are kind of the main two that didn't agree with me at all um, one of the really big ones, um, that was very positive. Um, like I had mentioned, I, um, been playing guitar for a while. I was working on recording music and stuff like that. And, uh, just from like the chronic inflammation and all this from the Moderna shot, I, um, I developed like tendonitis, tendinosis, my arms just, it was, I mean, I have a compression sleeve on right now, but, um, my arm was just totally out of, out of commission and I started doing this uh, peptide called BPC-157. And so it's kind of like a localized thing. So you do like the sub-Q shot. And, you know, so I'm doing it like in my arm area. And um, I think I'm about three months in right now. And it's got me, I'm still not at where I'd like to be. But I've been able to play guitar for like, um, you know, uh, I've kind of worked my way up to like two or three hours a week and before i was at like 15 minutes in a month or so like it was basically i couldn't play at all before so that one's really big for me and um kind of like a side note on that uh, me and brie had worked with this um uh the ozone clinic that i go to and they have this peptide and we had set up as like they're on the private like provider list so if anyone's interested to try that if they have like uh um you know tendon issues um they, they have they have other different peptides and supplements and stuff like that like i said ozone nad um you could reach out to us um if you're interested to try that and do like a free consultation with them but um yeah the bpc was definitely a, a really big one for me for sure do you want to put the name of the clinic that you see in the chat for people that live in the midwest um, I don't know how to drop it in. Do you remember what it is? I, I, I don't know how to. You can text it to me and I'll throw it in there. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll add it in. But uh, yeah, they have a lot of different stuff. Like they have thymosin 1, thymosin 4. Um, and 
one of the other ones that uh, was recommended by this like naturopath kind of alternative doctor place. Um, there's this brand called Prodrome and uh, it's Prodrome Glia. It's like this really fancy omegas. So I've been recently was, was doing um, this omega with the thymusin four and the, um, the BPC. And I think it's kind of helped calm down some of my neuro symptoms. And uh, so you know, it's just, it's a lot of trying different stuff. Unfortunately, this, a lot of the things that they have there are very expensive. Um, but it, it, it personally, for me, it's been helping. So, um, you know, I do think that any of this kind of stuff, you know, everyone should do as much research as possible. You know, this is just my personal experience with it. I know, you know, there's probably other people that it doesn't agree with them or, um, but, uh, yeah, Bree, let me try to message you that real quick. So I can, we could drop it in. And then Justin, it's kind of funny that you're like, yeah, ozone worked okay. Cause I did ozone too. And that didn't work for me very well either, but there's other people in the chat that they, say they didn't tolerate it very well either. But Lisa Grioli asked Justin, do the peptides reduce swelling or inflammation? So the the HBOT was the one that I haven't tried. The ozone, I feel like it's kind of tricky. Like it kind of fluctuates sometimes. I feel like it gives me a little bit more of a symptom relief. Um, I do remember before I started doing ozone, I would have these horrible like long flare ups where like my entire arms and feet would just be on fire for months or my face, like right after I got the vaccine, the left side of my face has just been numb uh, or burning, tingling, all that. And since doing ozone, it's kind of hard. I don't know if it's from ozone, but I feel like it's kind of calmed down those flares. But sometimes like certain sessions with ozone, it seems like it gives me a little bit like that Herx reaction, like the detox kind of thing a little bit. So I do like ozone, um, but sometimes it feels like I get a little bit more of a benefit, sometimes not as much. But to answer that question, so the thymusin, um, thymusin 1, uh, it's primarily like there's a whole lot of stuff with these. It's like um, anti-inflammatory, like antiviral, antibacterial, anti-cancer, all these types of things. There's a lot of benefits to it. Um, it's an immunomodulatory, so it's kind of one of those tricky things. If you have crazy immune system stuff, um, it could be great or it could kind of bring things in the wrong way. Um, I do feel like personally for me, the thymus in one um, helped calm down some of the inflammation stuff as well. I think the thymus in four peptide um, is a little bit more neuro focused um, for, you know, just widespread nerve health and also like uh like brain protection um but it has similar overlaps as well um with thymusin one and uh but yeah kind of all three of those kind of fall into like the um anti-inflammatory benefits yeah thank you that's a lot of good stuff so um Bree, let's talk about your probably, I guess, something that works the best for you that you've experienced and maybe some things that that haven't. Um, OK, so things that work the best for me, number one, pacing, number two, clean diet, number three, um, it's a whole laundry list of medications, but IVIG, fortunately for me, has worked out a lot of people it doesn't work out. So there's a lot of these therapies that, and you guys know this too, you try therapy and you don't know what it's going to do. Um, and IVIG is one of those. It seems like it's like, you know, 60, 70% of people have a benefit, but the people that do have a benefit are people that haven't been able to get anything else to work. Um, so to find something that works and helps, it's like, yes, we'll stick with it, you know? And so it's kind of like Kyle with the H bots, like it works, you know, and nothing else is working. So yes, I'm gonna stick with it and do it. So, um, but pushing myself mentally and physically is probably the most catastrophic thing that I can do. Um, 
And I learned that the hard way because when I first got sick, I was super, you know, right before I got sick, I was very athletic. Um, my body was probably in the best shape it had been in since my gymnastics days when I was younger. And, um, and there was no way I was going to beat that. Cause like when I was gymnastics, I had a six pack, but, um, and Kyle, that's hard for a girl. I don't care what you say anyway. So, but, um, when I got sick, it was, I'm going to treat this like an athletic issue. Right. So the second that my physical therapist was like, okay, you got to get up and walk and move your legs and see if you can reconnect the brain to your legs. I was all for it. And I pushed and pushed and pushed. I pushed as hard as I could to the point where um, I would waddle literally with my mom um, around the block. So I'd waddle around the block and my legs would be super noodly and shaky. And my mom is old and she'd be super shaky too. So it was kind of pathetic. But um, what happened was I pushed myself too far. I'd sit down and my electrical sensations were horrific, horrific. And so, and it would, I'd pay the price for like two days. My digestive system would be off. Everything would not be going well. So um, I learned the hard way and it took me like five, six months to figure out that I was pushing myself too far physically and paying the price. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> okay. That's good. Um, it's, it's super fascinating because I kind of went down that same route as well. So my background is exercise science, kinesiology, all those things. So I, you know, I've attacked this from a very uh, natural way and also, um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Brie, pushing myself. And, but that's how I figured out a lot of the things that cause problems for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think ultimately uh, this is um, in my opinion, it's, we got to, we got to heal, uh, heal ourselves at a cellular level. Um, and so I meant, I, I remember the previous webinar we had, we had a PhD biochemist talking about some really fascinating things the that chemical level that's going on. And I think he explained some of those things on why some of those reactions we're having when we push ourselves too hard. Um, and he mentioned, and I can't remember off the top of my head, I have to go back and look some of those, um, some of those things, reactions that are happening in our body. And, and when we exercise and push ourselves too hard, they increase and get inflamed. So I think it also from an exercise perspective, um, when we start exercising, you know, we, we start dumping different um, neurotransmitters and things in, in to our body to make our, our muscles fire across the synaptic cleft and things like that. Um, but if you do it too much, so, and I've read some studies on it that, that, you know, acetylcholine, you know, it, it can actually be an anti-inflammatory, but then when you start doing it too much, these other um, neurotransmitters come in and that's why you have that in, you know, that feeling, let's say after you run, you know, bike or swim, like a long ways, you get that kind of that gross, um, exhausted feeling. It's because those are just whirling around in your body. Um, and so with us, we get even more reaction. So it flares up all the things. And so I was looking at, um, different ways to go about this naturally, and I think, uh, again, in my opinion, you have to have a lot of things in, in line in your body, um, starting at the cellular level, um, to, to, uh, I guess, keep you, keep everything in check. Kyle, you got a question? Yeah. I was just going to say, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but it doesn't seem like my body really knows the difference between physical or emotional stress. Like so it's basically responding to that cortisol spike. And I know that anytime I've had to do public speaking or things like that, it'll throw me into a pretty bad flare, similar to like if I were to work out too hard. And so what I've found personally from, for me, I really can't do exercise where my heart rate gets above like 140 and I start to get anaerobic because once I start to get anaerobic, then it triggers whatever cortisol response and hormone response that sets me back. So that's where I started this past year um, in 2023, like early 2023, I started walking a lot. And so that was kind of my way to get back. And I started walking, you know, a mile a day. And then I worked up to three miles a day. And then I was doing like five miles a day. And then I was, I was thinking of doing this big, um, like walk 
across the country type thing for a fundraiser, but we ended up deciding against it just for PR reasons. Um, but anyways, I was walking like five, six, seven miles a day and keeping my heart rate below like 115. And that was how I could slowly get that built up. But if, if I were to go to the gym right now and do an interval, I'd be, I'd be sick for a few days. I'd have chest pain. I'd feel like crap. My fatigue would be really high. And so I just have to manage that cortisol response, whether it's like in physical form or emotional form. And that's hard to do, especially when you're depressed or feeling hopeless or sad. And there's a lot of things going on. I know we can all relate to um, having hard conversations. We don't necessarily want to have sometimes with people that aren't as empathetic. So yeah, I, I went to like a meeting, a dinner meeting the other day. And one guy was just basically said vaccine injuries are fake. No one's ever been hurt. You're a liar. You need to shut up. And it triggered such a bad response. And I had chest pain for like three days after that. So again, it wasn't like an exercise induced thing. It's a cortisol spike and um, norepinephrine. And so for me, that's something I have to be really cognizant of. And one thing that did help is I have like one of those little Garmin watches and it kind of measures your HRV for your body battery. So it'll kind of measure the state of fatigue you're in. And then also measure like um, basically cortisol or stress spikes. And so that helps me manage that a little bit. So that might be something people would want to think about too. Yeah, yeah I definitely. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Justin. I definitely have that a lot as well. I've noticed more um, as this has went on with, you know, the stress factor and the ang like anger. I mean, we all have this anger, stress, depression, all these different factors. And, you know, I feel like when I can kind of manage my, um, like trying to focus on, I know it's really hard, but one of the things um, that uh, I had done this like free course with a friend, it was kind of just like this thing on like mindfulness. And I'm just like, I'm trying whatever at this point. And one of the things kind of was like to focus on for me, it was gratitude. So instead of thinking about all these things that I've lost and like, oh, my prior life, I could do this, 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 I can go to, you know, whatever it is, you know, focusing on like I can walk outside and get some fresh air and feel the sun and, you know, look at the, the birds and all these very kind of simple things that a lot of us would take for granted in, in you know, prior injured life. You know, I can find. I try to focus on the beauty in a lot of these things. And I feel like when I can shift into really locked in, it's like a gratitude focus. It really helped, especially like my nervous system stuff, like my, the burning, freezing, numbness, tingling stuff. Um, you know, when I can kind of calm down my, my anger, um, and stress, depression, all that, you know, it feels like the, the, the nervous system stuff calms down on the other side of that it's kind of challenging because sometimes like you know like like kyle was saying you can get triggered we can get triggered from a lot of people left and right you know we get we get from both sides and um so i think that's a big part and then kind of like to throw in a quick side part too um brie i know the other day we were talking about some stuff with like the mitochondrial health i think i dropped a comment on there there's this thing that uh, when I was talking with Peter Corey, he had recommended this. Uh, I got some stuff over here because I don't want to forget to bring it up. There's a pure encapsulations renewal is what it's called. It's for mitochondrial health. It has like mitopure, um, resveratrol and CoQ10. Um, I feel like that's one that's definitely been been uh, helping as well. So I think and then like some different stuff like PQQ, you know, I think like trying to keep our uh, mitochondrial health in check or prevent it from getting worse um is a big part as well so i just kind of wanted to slip that in for like the you know mitochondrial um factor awesome. are any of the other panelists here doing looking at the mitochondrial stuff i i am um that's where i was kind of going it all starts like down at the cellular level and a lot of the things that we're talking about here actually help um at that cellular level, like decreasing cortisol, decreasing, uh, you know, all the, you know, the, you know, increasing like your dopamine and all these things that will help you. They start at that cellular level and it starts with repairing uh, or boosting your mitochondria, doing those activities that decrease that. You mentioned going outside, you know, and, you know, I don't want to get all hippie or whatever, but rounding yourself, um, meditation, um, breathing exercises, cold therapy, cold showers, um, you know, those types of things help, um, decrease those chemical levels in your body from freaking out. Also balance, you know, your nerves, right. Get your vagal tone going. 
Um, a lot of those things help you um, balance those at, at a chemical level as well. Kyle, did you are like a, a cold therapy pro at this point. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's what I was going to actually touch base on a little bit is um, and when Justin was talking about working on keeping your nervous system calm. Um, so one thing that happened to me is I went through all the hyperbaric treatment and I got my fatigue levels to be normal for the most part. Like I can actually function and work in the world a little bit, but I kept having really bad autoimmune flares with not only my skin, but I also developed like ulcerative proctitis, which is um, like a colon issue. So I was having a lot of autoimmune issues and like really reacting to foods. Um, I was really sunlight sensitive as well. Like if I was driving, my left arm would break out in hives because it was on the side of the driver window and my right arm would be in the shade and it wouldn't break out. And so I ended up doing um, a lot of stuff to try to get that calmed down. And that was where I did chromalin sodium, which is like a mast cell stabilizer. But with that being said, I finally just, they tried to put me on prednisone for like the millionth time. And I was just, I tried it for a bit. I felt like crap. And I finally got really frustrated and I just said, I'm going to try anything. So I bought one of those ice bath things or like a converted chest freezer. And I committed to doing five minutes a day at 39 degrees every day for 45 days. And it was like the most difficult thing I've done for sure. And it took a lot of like, <laughs> just it was really hard. Um, but over that process, my skin got to the point where I wasn't flaring. My ulcerative proctitis started to clear up and I was able to kind of work on getting my nervous system to calm down quite a bit through that. And I know that Wim Hof has done a lot of research on, um, they would take people's blood who had done cold therapy work and then they basically inject it with a neurotoxin and they'd look at the response of the immune system to the neurotoxin. And it was drastically different on someone who did no cold therapy. And then after they did 30 days of cold therapy exposure, then the neurotoxin response is a lot different. So there is research on that, um, but it's one of those things where it's very difficult it's very easy to trigger yourself and do too much. And so one thing I've told people that are like interested in trying it is even if you can get just like a cold bowl of water and put your face in, you know, for 15, 20 seconds at a time, it triggers something in your body called your mammalian dive response, which is essentially when you go on underwater, your body goes, okay, I'm going underwater. I need to slow down my breathing rate. I need to start changing all these different hormone levels because I'm going to be in an oxygen deprived environment for a second. And so you can trigger your mammalian dive response, even with just like a cold bowl of water and work your way up to doing cold showers and then work your way up to doing like an ice bath or cold plunge. Um, but especially now that it's winter, if you have a creek or river or stream nearby, then it might be worth trying. And they say 15 minutes a week is like the threshold that they found at the Salk Institute for, you know, basically having a change and to elicit a change in your body. Um, I just said, I'll just do five day, five minutes a day every day. And those kind of my thing, but if you did three minutes a day, five days a week, that's what they found to elicit a change in your nervous system. So if you have any other questions, let me know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good stuff. I've been doing that for about a year now and, and it's, it's awesome. So I, I highly recommend, and I, I you know, I had a lot of nervous system, weird stuff and things like that. And it, it calms me right down. Um, I think that there's, it's almost like you need to do a series of things, at least for me, every day. Um, and that includes that, you know, we're taking all the, the, the different supplements again, down at the cellular level. Like I've recently started taking, um, you know, like methylene blue, um, NAC, uh, glutathione. Um, there's a bunch, I can't remember, but a bunch of supplements that balance out, um, you at, at, you know, a cellular level, you know, you, you got to make sure you're getting everything balanced right there. And then you can kind of start working from there. And then that helps. And then like we talked about the cold showers, the grounding, the meditation, the breathing, all those things help keep you in balance. And that's how it goes with me. Um, and another big thing for me is sleep. If that's probably my hugest one, is that a word hugest? Um, if I don't sleep at least seven hours a night, it just boom, it's right back. I, I, yesterday I didn't sleep very good the night before. And yesterday it was, it was bad. Um, so sleep and then re mention nutrition, your nutrition again is huge, huge, right? Um, you can't be eating the garbage stuff that messes with you, um, at the cellular level and you know, it, all, all of it, right. Mm -hmm. You have to be eating clean, um, getting enough sleep, drinking enough water. And then the one thing I really quick, just want to touch on that I see a lot of in, 
chats and on social media and stuff is people are worried about they're not able to exercise again or they're worried about uh, muscle wasting and things like that. And so um, the last over the last year or so, um, I have been working on a program to help with help you with that. And it kind of touches on what Kyle was talking about. You get to a certain level and we flare. Right. So through my research, I found um, if we walk, like Kyle has mentioned, we keep our heart rates down. And then if you want to lift weights, um, I think a lot of people think working out, we have to get our heart rate to a certain level. We have to run. We have to bike. We have to swim. We have to overexert all this stuff. We don't. We have we can walk and then we can lift heavy weights. So what you do is, is you, you know, of course, this is all with good good form and everything like that, but you go in and you lift and you do one set, like five reps and then rest anywhere from three to five minutes. So you keep your levels down and then you still are, and then you go back and you can do another one. You might not be able to do, you know, like you used to. And, you know, if you're, if you were, I don't know, a CrossFitter, or, you know, bodybuilder, power weight, whatever, power lifter, um, you might not be able to get there, but slowly over time, like I was in the same place. Like I used to be, you know, again, special warfare unit. I was like, you know, hitting it really hard in my workouts every day. And then after this happened a month later, I tried to even just jog again and I about collapsed. Um, and so I've been working at this from that point on, and now I can lift, um, as much as I used to, but I do it very slowly if you will yeah lauren like, I'm, the exact, I'm the exact same way and i actually just got back from the gym but they have me they have the whole workout program and then they just tell me to set out all the cardio stuff and so i just don't do any of the cardio and i go through the weight routine with them like we've been doing um a couple months of like six to eight reps on things pretty heavy and so i've been doing that been building muscle getting back but just skipping all the cardio and trying to work back however i like couldn't i could not have done that um, before i started doing the hyperbaric even lifting or doing a push up or anything, it just set me back so much. And then once I was able to finally get enough of a plateau to start like taking those little baby steps, then it was just, you know, walking around the block, walking three blocks, walking mm -hmm. a mile, walking five miles, and you start to work your way up to where you can do that. Yeah. And it's all starting with like getting, getting your balance right. And then, you know, as far as like a chemical level in your body, and then you start very slowly with that walking and everything like that. And then you start even, I started lifting weights and I literally did I did one set of five and then I was like, cool, <laughs> I feel all right. And it, and it took, you know, it took a couple years to get where I'm at now. So I, I'm, I'm on all those supplements, making sure that the chemical levels are right. I'm sleeping, cold therapy, all those things. And then, um, and now I can lift and I can, I can hit it decently hard. I still rest a solid five minutes between each, each set, but, but you can start to do that. And that combats again, it dumps you know, the anti-inflammatory acetylcholine in, it helps build your muscles. There's so many studies out there for um, muscle mass and strength that lead to fighting chronic disease, um, lead to longevity and things like that. And so I think if, if you start really slow, you can get slowly work your way back. And also um, it's one of those things that helps you in this process as well. Kyle. Yeah. If, if your oh. body's ready. Correct. Yeah. That is the thing. You ha it's a building block approach. I'm not saying go out and start hucking weights around. It's a building block approach that can take years. Like I'm telling you, I, I, it took me yep. two plus years to get to work back where I'm at now. But I feel so like... can I can I throw something in there Please. for Justin too? So because I'm a girl and I'm wussy now. No, and I no own way. it and it's fine. So <laughs> But um, anyway, so I started with my, my, I have a cute little neighbor that's got chronic fatigue. And so she started coming over uh, twice a week and we do wall Pilates. I don't know if you guys have seen that on YouTube, but it's like super simple, like, you know, is it called, you know, like centralized ice, you know, isolated muscle flexing. So you're going to be working your glutes one day for five minutes, right? But you're horizontal. The reason why horizontal exercise isn't useful, especially when you're starting out, even before, if walking is too hard, try doing a little bit of wall Pilates because um, you're horizontal. When you're vertical, if you have pots, 
your resting heart rate is going to be like 80 beats a minute. And that's high for resting um, heart rate but still. And then you stand up, your heart rate's going to go up to 130, 140, right? So if you're exercising horizontal, your base heart rate is going to be lower, which means that you're going to be able to do more without dumping adrenaline into your body. Because what happens is when you stand up, your body all of a sudden starts dumping. It's from, it's from back here. Um, it, there's some hormone release that happens back here, norepinephrine and epinephrine. And it dumps down into the vasculature. And then all of a sudden your body starts getting revved up like it's got adrenaline. And then it, you're going to be standing there like that. And then you're going to start walking. And that adrenaline is just going to keep spinning. Mm -hmm. So if you want to start from horizontal and start working your way up, that could be a good place to start. But the other thing is, is like if you're doing horizontal stuff or vertical stuff and you're noticing that your body is not handling it, back up, back yeah. it up. Yep. Um, if your body is not stable enough to do any kind of stuff, then, you know, this all, you, you got to have like a right, you know, exercise therapist working with you closely on this stuff. Um, but you yeah, got to listen like to your body. I feel like a good al analogy is like this health journey is like stacking dominoes. And if you try to go too fast or you do something wrong, you'll hit one of them and you'll just relapse and you'll undo oh. all the work you just did. And so it's like, it's a very hard journey because it's literally take one step. Okay. I did that. Okay. Take one step. Okay. We got that and start just this slow road and you will have setbacks, but it's trying not to get to the point where you flare so bad. You just unwind all the hard work you just did. Um, and yeah, it took, it took me at least like two years of just slow growth to get to the point where now I can exercise like three or four days a week pretty consistently. Um, and then, like I said, just managing those cortisol triggers is really huge. So like removing stressful people from your life, trying to avoid those stressful conversations if you can, I think that's been hugely helpful. But I saw someone ask about fasting too, and that might be good to talk about. Yes, this. it's another one, another really good I one. I feel super bad, Justin, I cut you off before you are gonna say something about exercise. Yeah, no, there's a couple of things. I don't, I don't want to cut anyone off. I feel like, you know, I've had the um, fatigue kind of comes and goes in severity. And I feel like one of the things for me is like really trying to dial in. I feel like with the fatigue, it's easy to just want to sit around and feel like you're getting rest by not overexerting. But then it doesn't feel like you're actually getting rest and recovering, um, I just always feel drained. So I feel like I kind of learned, you know, if I'm sitting around doing nothing, my fatigue is worse. And if I try to do too much walking, it's worse. So like, I think, I think walking is really important trying to find, um, a sweet spot. And I think for me, I kind of worked into like around 45 minutes to like an hour and a half a day, kind of staggered throughout the day um so i think that's a really um important one for me and there was something else i can't remember what someone was saying but i had one i think someone had mentioned some type of gastro thing um i have like some of my supplements over here like i said i don't want to forget um i feel like ginger root has been extremely helpful for like gastro issues um calming everything down and then um, kind of like with the, I think early on when I would try to walk, it just, um, my tachycardia issues, just the chest pain would like, I'm like, I, I feel like I'm like afraid to just try to walk around and, um, like with all this that's been going on, I can't like work a normal job anymore. So I've just been like doing Uber eats. And I remember there was one day, like I was just trying to like bring someone their coffee in the mall and I'm like. I literally was like, I'm getting chest pains. I feel like I'm like going to have a heart attack. It was like this whole crazy thing. And I was talking with my aunt and she had rec recommended a hawthorn berry. And it's another one of these, let's like heart health, vascular health, all these kinds of things. And I feel like from me doing hawthorn has helped me get to being able to like take away that chest pain um, severity i feel like it would probably be like you know once a month i would just get like this like i feel like i'm about to have a heart attack and with me doing the hawthorn um i think it's definitely helped with that i know i think that that has one interaction so like any time i think you're going into supplements definitely make sure it's not interacting with medicine you're already taking or other supplements i think that one interacts with like beta blockers i want to say and um 
And then Brie, I know, I feel like me and you had talked about it a while back. There was like the, um, the nitric oxide stuff, like the cardio miracle. There's, um, uh, what is it? Uh, there's like vascular relax from pure. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's different stuff. Like I know a lot of us have talked about like natto kinase and lumbro kinase, you know, there's so many different things. I think the vascular, um, keeping our vascular system as healthy as we can will spike as messing it up, you know, helps us be able to get some of that exercise without risking, um, you know, uh, a really, a really bad flare up or like, you know, a, a heart attack or something crazy from trying to push it too hard. So I feel like for me, I was like, you know, early on, I was having a lot of the really bad chest pain and like limitations of like, I feel like I can't move much. And I kind of st started hitting it hard with like a couple of those supplements. And it definitely helped me uh, be able to be more active and then kind of, sorry, kind of sidetracked there, but with the, um, the fasting stuff, I, um, I've noticed that when I can get to, and it's one of these things you have to gradually work into it. And, you know, it's, it's definitely not for everyone. Um, I think like people have diabetes, it's, it's way more risky. Um, so if you're kind of looking into fasting, like I think Dr. Ely has a lot of great information on like supplements and stuff like that. And also with fasting and like the three day fast is the best, like you're getting stem cell regeneration from that but you have to gradually work into that and like make sure have like you have sugar uh monitor so like if your sugar is too low you know so you have to take that very seriously and uh but yeah i feel like when i would do the three-day fast it kind of just felt like i just temporarily felt closer to my old self and i uh, would get some symptom relief definitely like with some of the inflammation stuff like that so sorry i feel like that was a lot of stuff trying to jam in there no, that was, that was great. Uh, I, I do that fasting too. And I think fasting is phenomenal. Again, I think it's like this building block approach and it's almost like we have to do all these things almost, you know, daily and weekly to maintain, you know, kind of like this homeostasis in our bodies. Um, but I mean, it's all good for us. You know, even if, even if we weren't damaged, if we were doing all the things we're talking about, it, it'd be good for us. So I, I think with oftentimes with Americans, we want the the now result, right? We want this immediately, just pop some pills and get and be done with it. And I don't think that, um, especially in our case, we're in that place. We have to do this, these things over and over in this building block approach and maintain like this uber healthy lifestyle to to stay in homeostasis. Again, someone in in the uh, the Q and A asked about clean eating that I'd love to touch on asking uh, Brie, when, when you mentioned clean eating, give us some, uh, give us some things, um, that have to do well, with clean eating for you. Okay. So everybody has a different approach to their diet, right? Um, there's actually, there's an interesting researcher that we partner with, um, Tom Bunker. If you go on the react 19 site under research, you'll find his IRB approved study. It's, um, a, as of six months ago, it was the only long COVID study that was IRB approved for therapeutics. Um, I'm sure that's not the case now, but so if you have not tried fasting and you want to try it, um, I would suggest uh, signing up for that study so you can monitor how you do with it so he can collect the information and then we can really understand what's going on with fasting. Um, anyway, with that said, uh, I don't do well with fasting because I think my blood sugar just doesn't sustain it very well, but I do fast for two meals a day and do fine. So if I eat dinner, then I can go on a water fast for breakfast, lunch, and then I've just got to eat dinner the next day. Um, and I think it helps for me. It's, it's been a mixed bag. Um, it's, I can't eat gluten. <laughs> I can't eat dairy. And I do say I can't because I miss those things. Um, and anything, basically anything that comes out of a package I'll, it will flare me. Sugar flares me super bad. My blood sugar or, or my blood pressure uh, naturally is low. And it was low before my injury. But because I'm not exercising, low blood pressure now translates to POTS now. 
Um, so I have the green light to consume as much salt as I can. Um, so I'm supposed to eat two, a quarter teaspoon of salt every two hours, even if it's overnight. So they have me on some salt tabs. It's called thermo tabs. They use it for athletics a lot. Um, I can use liquid IV. Um, and, you know, to be honest, really, it's just my favorite is homemade potatoes with like a ton of salt. So I eat a lot of salt with potatoes, a little bit of rice with salt and basil and a little bit of coconut oil. Just those three ingredients will make you a very good tummy friendly, like gentle little snack um, that's not going to flare you unless you're allergic to rice. But yeah, and I can't have normal cooking oils, soybean oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, all those are out. So for me, it's, it's like, I'm eating like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Margie, I still eat meat. Uh, but it's, it's like whole food. So everything that I see, it looks like it came, I know where it came from. You know what I mean? That's one of the things I heard when I was looking into this was somebody said, if you can't tell where the food came from out of the ground or off of an animal, then you shouldn't be eating it. Um, and so we make a lot of stuff from scratch. The stuff that we make, we freeze right away. So it doesn't grow histamines in the fridge to, to eat for leftovers another day. Um, but it's basically low histamine diet, anti-inflammatory diet, uh, is, is what I've been able to live off of. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that, um, that's how we all should be eating anyways, is very clean. You know, if it comes out of a box, a, a bag or a can, you should probably not be eating it. It's all very fresh, clean food, um, you know, as best as you can. And I think that's one of those things that's going to keep you, again, you know, starting at the cellular level um, in a good place. And then even, oh. even, sorry, go ahead. Um, and there's one other thing. So everyone's like, you know, IVIG is really hard to get, right? It's a pain in the butt to get. Um, insurance doesn't cover it. Everyone's like, I just need IVIG and I'll be better. I will tell you right now, if you get IVIG or any of these other therapies that mess with your immune system and you're still eating like crap, it will be completely useless. You have to be consuming clean food, stopping the inflammation that's going into your body through your mouth and through the, you know, lotions and the air, you know, air candles in the room or whatever else you got going on, you've got to reduce all of that stuff that's infl causing inflammation in your body. Otherwise, mm -hmm. IVIG and these other big gun therapies are not going to do anything. So anyway, just wanted to add that in there. That's awesome. Thank you, Justin. And then we'll go to Kyle. Yeah, I was just kind of wanted to add on to that. I think that like the anti-inflammatory diet was huge for me as well. Um, you have you have to cut out the processed stuff. Um, I think it's challenging because a lot of people like, you know, we just this has been so challenging to go through. It's like we want to have a cheat day. Then the cheat day can kind of turn into a couple cheat days in a row. And then it's just a landslide. You really have to, you know, not let that kind of get out of control. So. You know, I think there's a couple categories and it's hard, um, like the people that like really go into the weeds with this stuff is like, you know, like the low, the anti-inflammatory, low histamine, um, there's like the oxalates and then there's glutamates. So a lot of these things, like you're eating one thing, you can kind of be going towards the other things. So you kind of have to be aware of like, I luckily, I, I kind of thought I was starting to have gl high glutamate levels because I'm doing like you know, I'm doing, um, some like macadamia, like, uh, you know, nuts and like, a uh, couple different kinds of mushrooms. Like I feel like lion's mane has been helping me with like some of the memory stuff. And then ginkgo is like a nervous system one that also helps with, um, memory. And also I think the other, one of the other properties is like, it helps with like sticky, sticky blood. So kind of trying to avoid some of these clotting issues. So there's a lot of these different like supplements, but, I didn't even realize until recently, like they were all high in glutamate and then high glutamate, glutamate toxicity for a long period of time can literally cause like, you know, um, neurodegenerative diseases. So I'm like, you know, at one point I'm like, am I doing all these things with the right intention? And I just missed out one little piece. I just did like the lab work and it shows that um, my glutamate levels are in check, but 
you know, so it's challenging. It's like, you really have to look at, you know, and then another part, I forgot to mention this. Like, I think it's really important too, for like the supplements, you know, it's, 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 it's hard for a lot of us because this stuff is so expensive, all the stuff we're trying. So it's easy to like, you know, want to go into the store and like, oh, here's a, um, whatever turmeric um, for trying to help with inflammation and I'll just get the cheapest one. Then you get the cheapest one. There's probably some additives and stuff in there that you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. So you kind of have to find good quality brands. Like I like Thorn, Pure, Gaia. Um, I think uh, Global Healing is another one. And, uh, you know, so I definitely like went into the weeds with the, um, the supplements and stuff like that. And even, even me, I feel like, you know, there's still some stuff that I miss. So trying to look into different categories, like I had mentioned. And then a while back, I saw some people that were talking about like sleeping issues. Um, I feel like for me at night, um, like magnesium, uh, GABA and, uh, melatonin kind of helps me just kind of like calm down that nervous system more to help me fall asleep. And, um, the one, uh, the ozone place that I go to, they have like this mixture that's, uh, taurine, magnesium and GABA together. And, uh, taurine there's like some studies that say that that can help with uh tinnitus so i feel like that's actually been one for me um that kind of helps keep that um calm down a little bit so i just kind of wanted to throw in some of that extra stuff as well awesome thank you kyle yeah i just wanted to kind of add a little bit into the fasting thing um so for me the way that i got diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome was actually by using fasting as a diagnostic tool and so I ended up doing a four day fast and I was doing a water fast. So it was like just electrolytes, um, basically those element pouches for a four day water fast. But I was also monitoring my um, ketone level and my blood glu glucose the whole time just to make sure that I was safe. And so I did the four day fast and on the fourth day, that's when I was obviously feeling really fatigued because of not eating for a few days. But that's when I started to feel like my joint pain and a lot of the tendonitis I was experiencing go away. And so it kind of was like, oh, light bulb food is a trigger for me. It's triggering my body. I went into the allergist. We ended up doing the test. I got diagnosed with mast cell. And then when they did the skin prick test, I lit up positive on everything. And so she said, because you're testing positive to everything, that doesn't mean that you're allergic to everything. It means that your body's reacting to anything foreign. So that's where I was able to get the uh, mast cell stabilizer, which is a chromalin sodium. And that helped me go from like having such a limited diet where anything would flare me and make me feel really tight and kind of sick to um, I could have a little bit more of a varied diet. And then what they ended up doing is they had me come in and take a list of like the six or eight foods that I want to eat. And they did a uh, blood IgE test on that to see if I was actually allergic, like if my immune system was allergic to those foods. And with that IgE blood test for the foods, I ended up finding out that I was mildly or moderately allergic to like rice, um, beef, chicken, quinoa, coconut, avocado, like a lot of these things that are healthy foods that I was consuming a lot of, but I was having a blood immune response to them. And so that's something that might be worth doing for people. Um, that was really helpful because it ended up with the IgE blood test, they found out that I was not allergic to eggs, I was not allergic to pork, and I was not allergic to a few other things that I could kind of start eating more of. And when I was taking the chromalin sodium and avoiding those foods that I'm, that are healthy foods that I was actually reacting to, um, it helped me just kind of build that plateau and get better. So that's one thing I definitely recommend because it sounds like, you know, with the vaccine, it creates a spike proteins and then you have the adjuvants, which make your body create an immune reaction to these foreign proteins. However, it could also get like confused and make antibodies to or antibodies that are protein sensitive. And so if you take an avocado and you eat it and it has a protein structure that looks similar to what your body thinks is foreign invader, then even if it's a healthy food, you can still have a reaction. Um, so that's where those IgE blood tests are really important. But yeah. Yeah, that is awesome. Thank you so much. So um, we want to start wrapping this up. We've been on here a long time, a lot of good information. Um, so so thank you, panelists, for that. And thank you for all the questions. But we kind of want to run through what we've talked about. We talked about um, we started with HBOT, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and how that can work for somebody. Uh, positives and negatives, how it can work for some, how it doesn't work for others. It can also be expensive. And then some other alternatives um, might be the, um, it was it EWAT, 
um, I believe is what it was. Um, again, some other alternatives could be could be expensive as well. Um, but I think the gist is, um, and you could go down to the basics, is breathing, right? We need to get more oxygen into our cells. And that could also breathing with meditation and grounding can help calm you down as well. Um, we talked clean eating um, and some of the benefits there. We just kind of wrapped up with that. Fasting as well. Also exercise. Um, and then some of the supplements, um, Justin has mentioned uh, several of those um, that can benefit, ben benefit you, but it's one of those, and, and Kyle mentioned as well, you're going to have to try these things one at a time and then probably add some things in. Some will work and some won't. Um, and then I think basically you kind of have to do the, get, get the body, get the body in homeo homeostasis through all those things. It's not going to be a one size fits all and a one, you know, quick fix. So we need to use a building block approach and do all these things that can help benefit us, calm our body down and get, um, everything firing right. Justin, one more thing. Yeah, the last thing I kind of wanted to add in, I know like a lot of us have issues with uh, histamines and there's like the DAO. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that. Um, and, you know, that's like if you have any food with a, that could potentially flare it up, it kind of helps calm it down. And then, you know, just before kind of closing this out, I just and I kind of wanted to throw it out there that, you know, we've all been going through this extremely challenging life altering experience. And I think it's really important for, um, for us to like give ourselves love and grace for everything that we've been going through. And, you know, like I kind of just, I wanted to add this in, you know, like sometimes I feel like, I'm going in circles. I talk about stuff and people aren't like listening or, you know, some of the people like, you know, that think the shot was great and they're not going to change their mind. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I know for a fact that like all of us, everyone listening, all the vaccine injured people talking you spreading, spreading awareness, talking to people throughout day to day, we're making more of, an impact than we could really think. Sometimes it feels like, Oh, we're just kind of going through the day and talking with people. And, you know, like I've had people on uh, Facebook who kind of like message me and um, you know, like they were firm believers in the shots and like, Oh, I didn't get it. Cause I've seen what you've been talking about and seeing like, you know, some injured community friends sharing their experience. So, you know, just as kind of like a positive thing to, to, to add on or end on, I guess, like, you know, I feel like we are making a huge difference in this fight for truth and trying to, you know, make sure that this doesn't happen to more people. And, uh, you know, I've had some people that, like I said, um, have reached out to me. Sometimes I'm kind of feeling in a low point and it's, you know, it's like it's very inspirational to see what you're going through in the fight and spreading awareness. So I think. I'm not just saying that as like it applies to me. I think towards everyone, you're inspiring people, you're making a difference. And I think that all that is very important, you know, uh, so, sorry, I feel like it's kind of like a little hippie ish kind of thing, but, you know, just like to give yourself love and know that um, it's very powerful for your, your, your voice and how it's imp impacting other people. And even if sometimes if they don't, um, even if they don't verbalize it, I think sometimes they they'll sit and think about it and, you know, it might impact them. It might keep them from, you know, their kids getting an, another booster shot and, you know, we could be saving lives. And if, even if people don't want to admit it, we're making a huge difference. So, you know, I just kind of wanted to throw, throw that out there. Thank you, Justin. I will just, just add on to that. You know, as you go through this, we've all been through ups and downs and, and the key is, is 1% better every day, you know? And as long as we're trending in the right direction, we might have bad days, we might have good days, but 1% better, trend in the right direction, whether it's with your, you know, your therapies, your nutrition, your exercise, your, you know, your mental health, whatever it may be, just take it one day 
one hour, one minute at a time and think 1% better. And I think, you know, then we can all keep trending in the right direction and come together and help each other out. So thanks everybody for being on the panel and all, you know, all your input and thanks everybody for listening. Thanks we'll for the next one. Have a good one. Take care, y'all.